Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Authority. I'm Joseph Pierce. Thanks as always for joining me. And this week we will be um, focusing on John Dryden, one of the greatest poets uh, in the history of English literature, whom I nonetheless suspect that some of you might not have heard. Um, so uh, we would we, obviously be saying something about who he is as a person um, as regards his life, but also perhaps why he's not so well known today. Partly it's because the uh, the the poets of the 17th and 18th century, um, certainly Dryden uh, and Alexander Pope, um, became very unfashionable following the rise of the Romantic poets and, and the Romantic movement at the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century. Um, and so um, they were largely eclipsed and became unfashionable. And as Romanticism has largely held the high ground uh, since then, um, they, they, they really haven't come out of the eclipse. But it doesn't mean they're not wonderful poets who, who, who warrant our attention and indeed warrant being rediscovered. So we, we, we've spent some time actually in the 17th century, in the 1600s, we, in the last few episodes of The Authority. We, um, we, we had Shakespeare, of course, and uh, he lived 16 years into the uh, 17th century, um, and many of his best plays came from the early part of that century, Macbeth, King Lear, Hamlet, etc., Othello, uh, and so on. Uh, we then looked at um, uh, Richard Crayshaw, uh, whose father, William Crayshaw, was a great enemy of, of Catholicism, a great enemy of Shakespeare, a great enemy of the theatre. But Richard Crayshaw becomes a Catholic, and in consequence, during the turbulent time of the of the 17th century, the English Civil War was forced into exile. Then we looked at John Dryden, who is a contemporary um, uh of, of Richard Crayshaw, who, unlike Richard Crayshaw, was a very vociferous supporter of the Puritans uh, and supported Cromwell during the uh, uh, Civil War and advocated the execution of the king uh, and wrote Paradise Lost, as we know, and, and, and he was the focus last time. Well, John Dryden, again, you know, we, obviously you see we're living in very perilous times, the, the 17th century, the 1600s, a time of, uh, of of persecution, of civil war. And um, John Dryden is very interesting because he actually lives through all of this and, and, and he changes his perspective, he changes his position, he changes his religious beliefs, his creed, on more than one occasion. And some people think this is uh, just self-serving, moving with the times, going with the flow, taking the path of least resistance in, in order to gain the most in a worldly sense. Well, we'll see whether or not that's true, and then we will actually see that it isn't true ultimately. Um, so uh, as a young man, so he's born in 1631, so he's uh, only a teenager, uh, in fact, not even a teenager when the Civil War begins, and a teenager when it ends. In 1658, um, on the death of Cromwell, when most people were... Um, rejoicing uh, at the um, at the dissolution of of, of, of the the, the, Pur the Puritan tyranny uh, that th on the contrary John Dryden wrote a poem uh, of hero heroic stanzas on Cromwell's death eulogizing uh, Oliver Cromwell um, that was in 1658. And then years later, in 1682, he wrote a poem called Religio Laici, uh, in which he um, advocated support for the Anglican Church, for the established church, 
Um, uh, and this was certainly a switch from his earlier Puritanism to basically the perspective of the king who had been beheaded. So this is a, 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 a certainly a, a change of perspective, and we'll, we'll look at that poem a little bit a bit later on. And then in 1685, he converts to Catholicism. Um, and this is at, at the time that the Catholic king, James II, comes to the throne. So it's it's often said that, the, that, that this was a cynical, self-serving conversion, uh, uh, just as he had um, waxed lyrical about Cromwell when the Puritans were in power and had supported the Anglican Church uh, during the reign of, of Charles II. Uh, um, that uh, upon the accession to the throne uh, of James II, the Catholic king, 1685, he becomes a Catholic. In other words, he he changes his religion depending upon who has the power. And yet um, he remains a Catholic um, even after the uh, revolution in which the Catholic king James II is overthrown and forced into exile and another anti-Catholic regime is put in its place in 1688, that until the end of his life, 12 years later in 1700, that John Dryden remains a Catholic uh, and is uh, persecuted in consequence, uh, loses his status, his position. Uh, he was the first poet laureate of England. He's replaced as poet laureate. Um, he's forced to, to um, earn uh, an income th purely through the labors of his pen. So he accepts a great deal of suffering by remaining uh, a Catholic, and it's significant perhaps that one of his sons would go on to be a Catholic priest. So it, uh, irrespective of whether his conversion to Anglicanism was, was, uh, was genuine, and I suspect it was, I, I suspect what we see in place here is a journey. John Dryden's you know, it's, 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 it, each of our lives is a journey, a pilgrimage, ultimately, towards heaven, hopefully, uh, but not necessarily, of course. We can choose to go to the other place if we insist, um, but certainly we're called to take the path to heaven, the pilgrimage of grace to heaven. Um, and I would see that we see an ascent um, of, uh, of Dryden from a sort of low church Puritanism to a higher church, Anglicanism, and then ultimately an embrace of Catholicism. But I want to look at uh, some of the main features of his life and work. Um, so in 1668, he was appointed England's first poet laureate. And uh, actually, I returned from England recently. And amongst other things, we went to Westminster Abbey and to Poet's Corner. And John Dryden is indeed enshrined there in Poet's Corner. Chaucer, as the father of English poetry, has pride of place, perhaps, um, and but certainly John Dryden's bust is there prominently um, as uh, the first poet laureate. Um, and during uh, the period of the 18th century, 17th century, and even in the 18th century, so domin he dominated the literary life of England, of Restoration England. In other words, the Restoration England, England after the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, uh, following the fall of the Pur Puritan uh, tyranny. The period became known in Italy literary circles as the Age of Dryden. That's how prominent he was. It was the Age of Dryden. Dryden, the romanticist writer, Sir Walter Scott, the great romantic, called him Glorious John. So he made his name and following, I'd say, the, the Puritans banned the theatre, closed down the theatres. Um, but following the restoration of the monarchy, there was a great opening of theatres and a period of restoration drama, a restoration comedy, some of which were very baldy and debauched. That is often the case. A reaction is often an overreaction. We saw it, for instance, in the Soviet Union, you know, following the fall of the, shall we say, the Puritanism in terms of well, various things of, 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 uh, of the Soviet communism. We had a hedonistic debauch, uh, what we might call one hell of a party with the mafia taking over in the Soviet Union. Uh, following the fall of the uh, fall of communism, so the same sort of thing happened in uh, in England. That, that following the the, the 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 strict regime of the Puritans, we had this hedonistic outpouring uh, in, in the Restoration period in terms of Restoration comedies. Um, Dryden, to his credit, was not as debauched as many, but he was certainly made his name as 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 a dramatist and wrote many plays. But there's a there's a theme uh, that we see throughout his throughout his work, which is very important to us because he was one who who uh, helped to um, 
restore um, the the canon of great literature to to return to to the public's perception and enjoyment some of the great works of antiquity. So he wrote, for instance, uh, an adaptation of Shakespeare's final play, The Tempest. And of course, that's not that that's fairly modern in his time, but certainly it's part of the restoration of Shakespeare's um, reputation uh, in 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 ad- adapting The Tempest um, in in the late 1660s. He also adapted Sophocles' great uh, um, uh, tragedies, uh, the the Oedipus Cycle, Oedipus a Tragedy, um, as a, an adaptation of Oedipus, Oedipus Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. He uh, did a, a modern adaptation, a modern dramatization of Troilus and Cressida, uh, the ancient story which um, Geoffrey Chaucer had written about several centuries before. Uh, and this was all during that during his period as as a Protestant, uh, and following his conversion to Catholicism, he wrote fewer plays um, uh, and started working more on 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 the classical literature. Um, but he did write a, a play on on the uh, on on King Arthur, which is significant. He was a critic of the the, uh, the hedonism uh, of of his time. He criticised Charles the Second for his mistresses and his courtiers and his licentious lifestyle. And he also attacked the Earl of Rochester, who was a notorious womanizer. And uh, in return, the Earl of Rochester seems to have paid a, a gang of thugs to beat Dryden within an inch of his life. He was severely beaten um, for that. An award was put out uh, for the culprits, and they were never caught. That was in 1679. Uh, but again, he paid for his moral start, if, if you like, against the, the decadence of the time. But following his conversion to Catholicism, um, he spent a lot of time translating the great works of antiquity. So he translated the works of Horace, Juvenal, Ovid, Lucretius, and Theocritus. In 1697, he translated the works of Virgil. Uh, he translated the Aeneid into couplets. Uh, turning Virgil's ten thousand line poem into about a line a poem of almost fourteen thousand lines, um, and as a translator, he made great literary works in the older languages available for readers of English. So, those of us who love and admire classical education have a great deal to thank Dryden for, not just as a playwright and a poet in his own right, but as a translator of these epic works that are so much a part of the canon of Western civilization. But I want to turn now to to uh, say the three poems that that uh, that show the, the the turning points, the moments of conversion in his life. So again, from this book, poems every Catholic should know, published by Tan Books, which I uh, compiled, and go we go through chronologically. Um, I quote just two stanzas from uh, Religio Lisi. Thus man, by his own strength to heaven, would soar, and would not be obliged to God for more. Vain, wretched creature, how art thou misled to think thy wit these godlike notions bred? These truths are not the product of thy mind, but dropped from heaven and of a nobler kind. Revealed religion first informed thy sight, and reason saw not till faith sprung the light. Hence all thy natural worship takes the source. Tis revelation what thou thinkst discourse. But if there be a power too just and strong to wink at crimes and bear unpunished wrong, Look humbly upward, see his will disclose, the forfeit first and then the fine impose. A malt thy poverty could never pay, had not eternal wisdom found the way, and with celestial wealth supplied thy store. His justice makes the fine, his mercy quits the score. See God descending in thy human frame, the offended suffering in the offender's name. All thy misdeeds to him imputed see, and all his righteousness devolved on thee. This is actually quite a deep poem theologically, and what we need to understand here, this is a defense of faith from the emergent age of reason, so-called. And 
so I think it was the the nineteenth century art historian and aesthete um, John Ruskin who said that Venice uh, descent descended from being a medieval virgin to being a Renaissance Venus. So this is a, a, a literally an erotic fall from the virgin to to Venus from the pagan goddess of of love. The the the, the, the early Renaissance was very much uh, a product of of medieval Christendom. You look at early Renaissance painting, and the emphasis of, is upon scripture, upon the crucifixion, upon Madonna and child, etc. And by the late Renaissance, there is this neoclassicism, and it's what I call playing leapfrog because we cannot create anything ex nihilo from nothing if we want to escape from the status quo from that which is uh, present and uh, to us we 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 rediscover something that's gone before it we pay intellectual history leapfrog over history so the the late renaissance and the the early enlightenment and this is the period we're talking here the 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 beginnings of the enlightenment in 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 the 1600s in england um they, they, there's, there's a, um, a rejection of, uh, of Christendom, of, uh, 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 skepticism towards Christianity, and that hence the leapfrogging over the whole period of Christendom from the time of Christ to rediscover pre-Christian antiquity. Hence, uh, the discovery of Venus and 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 more and more paintings with uh, mythical gods and goddesses uh, and a return to pagan myths and 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 less and less uh, finding inspiration in scripture this was the culture uh, that was uh, in the ascendant at the time that dryden is writing that which would call itself superciliously the age of reason and again you can you can judge something by by what it calls itself uh, the, the very fact that this was the age of reason suggests that the reason didn't exist prior to this age and that great philosophers such as Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas were uh, were not rational but were superstitious. This is what C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobbery. Uh, another name that this, this, this movement would give to itself later, it's not in Dryden's time, but is the Enlightenment. Um, that in other words, that, that we are the enlightened ones and everybody before us was in the dark. So this superciliousness, this arrogance, this looking down our, our prideful noses at the past and everybody in it. This is the, this is the ascendant uh, mood, if you like, of, of aspects of the intelli- intelligentsia here. So we see in, in, in these stanzas from Religio Lacey, uh, Dryden's insistence that, f- that reason is inseparable from faith that fides et ratio, that faith and reason are indissolubly bonded. So um, just to reiterate some, some of these lines here, um, these truths are not the product of thy mind, but drop from heaven and of a nobler kind. Revealed religion first informed thy sight, and reason saw not till faith sprung the light. Hence all thy natural worship capital N, capital W, takes the source, tis revelation, what thou thinkst, discourse. So, we you know, the idea is that um, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, um, that this uh, makes philosophy, uh, knowledge, reason, uh, egocentric, right? It begins with the self which thinks, uh, whereas, of course, the, uh, an older understanding, which we see epitomized here in Dryden's verse, is that, on the contrary, we think before, because he is, that uh, we are made in, in the image of God with the Imago Dei, and we reason because God is the Logos, God is reason. Uh, we love because God is goodness, God is love. Uh, we create because God is the creator. In other words, that we are because he is we think because he is um it, it, we 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 it, it that ultimately reality is uh deocentric uh it's centered on god not um egocentric so this is basically he's fighting against this um this new rise of of what would become known as rationalism in this poem so this uh, marks 1682 his conversion to anglicanism um 
Uh, but then in 1685, he becomes a convert to Catholicism. And he writes this long allegorical poem called The Hind and the Panther, of which I just select a, pa a short passage, which we'll read uh, presently. So The Hind and the Panther basically is a, is a, a fable, if you like. It's a, it's a story uh, in which uh, beasts are used to convey uh, deep truths. Um, obviously, we see it in the Aesop's fables. Uh, we obviously see it, for instance, in uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, in the Nun's Priest Tale, with the the fable of Chanticleer, the uh, the rooster, uh, and uh, Pertilote, his favourite hen, by which we, we we the the story of the fool is retold. Well, in the Hyde and the Panther, we have this description of contemporary England. And this, by the way, is another reason why John Dryden and Alexander Pope and others are not as accessible, because they wrote a great deal uh, about the state of their own time, the problems of their own time. They were addressing things which were very topical. And of course, if, if, if you're writing about something which is very up to date, uh, it's going to be out of date. Um, that's why the greatest writers tend to be those that write about timeless things. And Dryden is writing about timeless things, but he's doing it within the context of topicality. So the hind and the panther of the poem's title, the hind is the Catholic Church, the panther is the Anglican Church. Uh, and although the hind uh, certainly uh, is the true church, the panther is seen as an ally uh, against the various other beasts which represent other philosophical and theological perspectives, other denominations of Christianity, but also um, other philosophical ideas. And, 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 and the purpose of the poem ultimately is that the Hind and the Panther should unite uh, in an alliance uh, of true religion against these new ideas and these, the and these theologically dubious uh, Christian denominations. So this obviously there's a political approach here. The Catholic Church is still, of course, um, um, uh, the time the Hind and the Panther is, is, is written, um, uh, James II is on the throne, but that is not going to um, last. The following year, um, James II is overthrown and anti-Catholicism comes back in. So at the time it's written, the Catholic Church is in the ascendant and it's the hind. So he's writing about the hind from a, from a perspective of, of worldly power. The king is a Catholic, but he's not turning on the panther. He's not turning on the the Church of England, the established church. In fact, he's calling for a union that the Anglican Church now should, if you like, become uh, an, 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 an ally of and ultimately be infused with and, and even ultimately encapsulated by uh, the Hind, by the Catholic Church. This is written in 1687. The following year, we have the Revolution, where the king is forced into exile. Um, and then, of course, the Panther. Uh, uh, hunts the hind again the hind is no longer in a position to 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 protect itself and, and and goes on the run with the panther in pursuit an irony there perhaps so um but as i said that um dryden remains a loyal catholic one of his sons becomes a priest uh he uh loses his position as poet laureate because of his refusal to uh, uh reject his catholicism um, and uh, as we say, he earns money by translating some of the classics of, of, of ancient literature for which we are uh, uh, the recipients and the beneficiaries. So I'm going to finish by reading from The Hind and the Panther, just the short extract I selected for poems every Catholic should know. What weight of ancient witness can prevail if private reason hold the public scale but gracious god how well dost thou provide for erring judgments and unerring guide thy throne is darkness in the abyss of light a blaze of glory that forbids the sight O oh, teach me to believe thee thus concealed and search no farther than thyself revealed but her alone for my director take, whom thou hast promised never to forsake. My thoughtless youth was winged with vain desires, my manhood long misled with wandering fires, followed false lights, and when their glimpse was gone, 
my pride struck out new sparkles of her own. Such was I, such by nature still I am. Be thine the glory, and be mine the shame. Good life be now my task, my doubts are done. What more could fright my faith than three in one? Can I believe eternal God could lie, disguised in mortal mould and infancy, that the great maker of the world could die, and after that trust my imperfect sense, which calls in question his omnipotence? Can I my reason to my faith compel, and shall my sight and touch and taste rebel? Superior faculties are set aside, shall their subservient organs be my guide? Then let the moon usurp the rule of day, and winking tapers show the sun his way. For what my senses can themselves perceive, I need no revelation to believe. So here we see in this passage from the Hyde and the Panther Dryden's Confession, an element of autobiography there, of his own journey, of his youthful vanity, of, of his uh, obstinate pride uh, that kept him from the one true church. But then now, basically, that, uh, of course, that in terms of reason, his human faculties are unable to fathom mysteries such as the Trinity um, or the Incarnation. But would God's truth be something which is subsistent within human reason? The way I sometimes talk about this, by the way, anecdotally, is, is you know, that to see us, uh, it, it might be appropriate to finish with a fable as, as the higher than the panther is a fable, where we I, I see, if you like, um, that our reason is a bit like a dog. So if you imagine a dog, the dog is waiting for its master to come home because when its master comes home, it will be fed and perhaps taken for a walk. It's excited. So when the master comes home, it's very excited, jumping around all over the place, wagging its tail, hoping to be fed or taken for a walk. And then to its disappointment, the master, rather than doing either of those things, sits down and picks up a big piece of paper, which we know is a newspaper. The dog does not know what a newspaper is. A dog can never know what a newspaper is, and certainly a dog will never be able to read the newspaper. The, all that the dog knows is that while the man is sitting there with this piece of paper in front of him, he's not going to be fed nor taken for a walk. In other words, that there's a limit to finite reason. Uh, and that th th our position our, uh, with, re with respect to the Logos, to divine reason, to the reason that creates the cosmos at every moment in its omniscience and omnip omnipotence and omnipresence, everything being present to it, is so infinitely larger than us. M the, the abyss that separates us from divine reason, the Logos, is much greater than separates the reason of the dog from the reason of its master and that's basically what John Dryden is saying in this poem that um, that he needs ultimately to accept revealed truth as revealed by Jesus Christ and as given in the teaching authority of the of, of the church as given by Christ to Saint Peter that that this is where his reason needs to reside it's not that the church teaches anything irrational but it teaches some things which supersede our finite capacity to fully comprehend and on that note uh and on this uh in the company of this convert to the faith in very perilous times who suffered for his conversion in the presence of this great poet john dryden um we will now leave you and thank you once again for joining me in the authority do to join me next week as we continue with the discussion of these great authors of the western canon until then goodbye and god bless this has been an episode of the authority with joseph pierce brought to you by tan for updates on new episodes and to support the authority and other great free content Visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters, 
to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.